Okay, thank you. So, all right. Uh, thank you for attending uh, my presentation. I'm gonna talk about my paper, characterizing the conditional pricing kernel, a new approach. The pricing kernel is one of the one of the most important concepts in finance and a critical component in asset pricing because it provides state prices for different states of nature. Also, it contains the information about investors' preferences or beliefs for the future economy. Due to this importance, economists have studied empirical identification of the, of the pricing kernel. Intuitively, uh, intuitively, intuitively, the pricing kernel should be downward sloping in aggregate wealth under the assumption that the representative agent is risk averse. However, using the stock market, using the stock market index and options data, uh, uh, several studies, several studies including Ahi Sahalia and Lowe and Jack Ward show that the, uh, an empirical pricing kernel is U-shaped and they call it the pricing kernel puzzle or anomaly. More recent studies refute the puzzle and show that it is downward sloping. Moreover, we can think about characterizing the pricing kernel conditionally versus unconditionally. If, if investors' preferences or beliefs change over time, then it is quite important to characterize the conditional pricing kernel in order to understand, uh, in order to understand asset prices. Uh, the pricing kernel is formally defined as the ratio of the risk neutral density to the physical density. The literature usually estimates the pricing kernel uh, projected on the market return because it is not easy to find the joint density functions of other state variables. Uh, first, uh, we can estimate the risk neutral density using a large cross section, large cross section of options data by following Britton and Lichtenberger. Second, for the physical density estimation, there are two common approaches. There are, uh, there are a rolling window estimation with historical return data and a parametric return dynamic estimation. However, relying on the historical, historical data causes timing mismatch between the two types of densities. But uh, by construction, the risk neutral density is for looking whereas the physical density is backward looking. If we assume a return, uh, if we assume a return dynamic to estimate the pricing kernel, then the result may depend on the return, uh, may depend on the return dynamic model. These shortcomings can be addressed for, uh, unconditional, for the unconditional pricing kernel as studied in Ahi Sahalia and Lo and Lin Shaib and Shun Wei. However, there is very limited evidence on non-parametric estimates of the conditional pricing kernel. So, uh, so in this paper, I propose a novel method to estimate the forward-looking conditional pricing kernel with the aid of conditioning variables, but without assuming a specific return dynamic under the physical measure. Then using the conditional, price, conditional pricing kernel estimate, I study its time series characteristics or how investors' belief change over time. Uh, moreover, I also investigate Im implications of the current pricing kernel estimates for the conditional risk premium. And of course, there are lots of other implications that I can think about and I plan to work on them. Okay, let me first summarize some uh, findings and contributions of this paper. I find that the VIX, term spread, and the market return are conditioning variables that are that are most informative about the condition that are most informative about the pricing kernel. On average, the monotonicity of the kernel estimate is not rejected. Also, the kernel estimate exhibits significant variation over time. For example, uh, for example, for state prices associated with negative future returns. Marginal rates of substitution or the discount factor are highly are higher when investors have more favorable information about the future market. For example, through uh, by looking at the low VIX. My paper can be also related to the literature on conditional uh, on conditional risk premium. 
My estimation approach enables me to calculate uh, for looking conditional risk premia directly using the conditional return distributions. And I find that during economically bad times, the, the equity premium inferred from my conditional pricing kernel estimate is entirely attributable to compensation for the left tail of the return distribution. To motivate, uh, to motivate uh, what I'm going to do next, let me give you some examples of very uh, some examples of estimations of the pricing kernel. Following the convention, I non-parametrically estimate the risk neutral density, and for for estimating the physical density, I use four different approaches: a rolling window estimation with historical return data by following Jackworth 2000 paper, the Garch dynamic estimation the stochastic volatility dynamic estimation and the stochastic volatility with a Poisson jump dynamic estimation. Okay, so this figure shows the average of the conditional pricing kernel estimates for, uh, for different specifications. The x-axis is the monthly market return and the y-axis represents the average pricing kernel. It is very clear that they are non. Uh, it is very clear that they are non-monotonic, but the shapes differ a lot across different specifications. Okay. Uh, for my main analysis, I use. Uh, for my main analysis, I use monthly data from 1996 to uh, 2020, and I obtain S&P 500 index and its returns data from CRSP. Uh, the index options and the risk-free rate from option metrics. I use in total 11, 11 candidate. I, I use in total 11 candidate conditioning variables for risk measures, including the VIX, uh, one investor sentiment, five economic indicators, including the treasury term spread and the market return. To explain how to explain how I estimate the pricing kernel. Let me first define a scaled pricing kernel, which is uh, which I denote as a small m here, as the ratio of the risk neutral density to the physical density without the risk-free discount factor. I assume that I assume that this scaled pricing kernel is a nonlinear function of the market return and approximated with a polynomial function. Here, BIT. Here, BIT is a time varying coefficient of the pricing kernel, which is expressed as a linear function of a conditioning variable ZJ, uh, ZJT. Note that without, without conditioning variables, it corresponds to the unconditioner pricing kernel. For implementation, I run GMM estimation using the, uh, using the following uh, orthogonality conditions. First, I use a statistical property, the universality of the uniform. A CDF itself always follows the uniform distribution between zero and one. And a kth moment, kth moment condition of a random variable following the uniform distribution should be, uh, should be one over one plus K. And this property must hold for the physical density, which can be represented by this first uh, equation. Using this moment condition to estimate the pricing kernel, I mean, uh, using this moment condition to estimate the pricing kernel is also studied by Lin Shive and Shumway. Second, I use the Euler equation with the market return and the risk free rate. Uh, finally, I include another, I include an additional uh, restriction. Since I'm not specifying the physical density separately, the ratio between F star and M, uh, which is uh, basically the physical density that should satisfy a property of a probability density, right? The, the integral of the physical density over the domain, for example, the integral of the physical density over the domain should be equal to one. And I refer to this as P density restriction. In order to incorporate this restriction into my GMM estimation, I express it as, a, as the following uh, moment condition. Since, uh, since the integral must be equal to one, its variance 
should be equal to zero. Okay. Uh, before looking at my conditional price synchronal estimates, I'd like to show how this estimation, uh, I'd like to show how this estimation works for the unconditional price synchronal. Panel A shows my estimation result. And for comparison, panel B shows the result of Lin, Scheib, and Shumei. And on the left-hand graphs, the blue line represents the unconditional estimates and the dotted black lines represent the 90% confidence intervals. Overall, both estimates look quite similar. However, if we look at the right-hand histograms that describe the distribution of the CDF values, and then, uh, uh, then we can see that there is a clear difference between those two uh, histograms. Of course, these two, you know, in panel A and panel B, these estimation approaches have some, you know, some other differences, but the main difference here is the inclusion of the p-density restriction in panel A. So as you can see through uh, these two histograms, the p-density restriction is well captured in panel A as all the CDF values are near one. For estimating the conditional price in kernel, I use, uh, I use the two-step efficient GMM estimation and since con conditioning variables that are most informative about the pricing kernel are unknown, I first run univariate, univariate regression, I, I'm sorry, uh, I first run univariate estimations using each of the 11 conditioning variables. Through statistical tests, I choose a set of preferred variables. And then using chosen conditioning variables, I run multivariate uh, estimation. Uh, this table shows the univariate estimation results. For example, the first row here corresponds to the case where I use the VIX as the conditioning, uh, VIX as the conditioning variable. The time varying intercept of the uh, the time varying intercept of the pricing kernel is determined by the first two coefficient here, beta zero zero and beta zero one, such that beta zero zero plus beta zero one times VIX is the intercept of the pricing kernel at time t. And negative beta zero one here indicates that when the VIX is higher, the overall level of the overall level of the kernel is lower around the zero rate of return. In the next column, a negative beta one zero indicates that the pricing kernel is uh, overall downward sloping around the zero rate of return. Uh, and this result is consistent across all different conditioning variables. And for the VIX, a positive beta one one here, uh, uh, for the VIX, a positive beta one one here indicates that when the VIX is higher, the negative slope becomes less steep. Less steep. So uh, I will provide more explanation about this time variation in the next slide, but uh, in order to choose most informative conditioning variables through this univariate estimation, I use two criteria. First, at least one parameter, at least one parameter associated, one parameter associated with the conditioning variable should be statistically significant. And the second, the over, -identif the over identification test in the last two columns should not reject at the 1% significance level. In the end, four variables, the VIX, sentiment, term spread, and the market return are chosen as, um, inf as informative conditioning variables. Okay. Uh, to further interpret the result, let's focus on the case where the conditioning variable is the VIX. Panel A here exhibits the average conditional pricing kernel estimate and the kernel and the pricing kernel estimate is almost downward sloping, but slightly increases in the light uh, in the right tail. And in the in panel B, I plot the sensitivity of the kernel estimate to the VIX by varying the VIX from the uh, from the fifth percentile to the ninety fifth percentile of its data. The blue line represents the kernel with the low VIX, and the red line uh, the red line represents the kernel with the high VIX. 
first, the variation is more pronounced. As you can see, uh, as you can see in this in this graph, the variation the variation is more pronounced in the negative negative return region, and it is probably because investors are generally more sensitive to uh, negative returns. And the second, for uh, for state prices associated with negative future returns, the pricing kernel is higher when the VIX is low. When investors currently observe a lower value of the VIX, future negative returns would be a, uh, would be a bigger shock to investors, uh, bigger shock to investors compared to when they observe a high value of the VIX. Then eventually it pushes the pricing corner upward. Okay, multivariate estimation results. Since the number of conditioning variables increases, increases the number of parameters to be estimated, in this estimation, I use the maximum of three conditioning variables. I consider two specifications. The first one is using the VIX, term spread, and market return. And the second one is using the VIX, term spread, and sentiment. Although the magnitudes of the parameters become smaller compared to, uh, compared to the univariate estimation results, the overall patterns, the overall patterns remain the same in both specifications. Then I choose the second specification as my main conditional pricing kernel estimate because the VIX, term spread, and the sentiment are all regarded as forward-looking variables. So as you can see here uh, through panel A and panel B, uh, so panel A corresponds to the conditional est average conditional estimates of the specification one and the panel and panel B corresponds to the specification two, and their average pricing kernel estimates are very similar. And panel C exhibits the sensitivity of the kernel sensitivity sensitivity sens I'm sorry <clears throat> sensitivity of the kernel to each uh, conditioning variable. And since three conditioning variables are considered all together in this estimation, each effect each effect becomes smaller but the patterns remain the same as the univariate estimation results. Okay. Now let's now let's talk about let's talk about the time variation of the pricing kernel in a slightly different angle. The empirical pricing kernel is a function of the future market return. And since we observe the realized market return data, I can find the realized pricing kernel value. For example, at time t suppose the price, suppose the conditional pricing kernel looks like uh, this blue line. And after a month, the suppose the realized monthly return is negative 5%. Then the realized pricing kernel value is going to be 1.05 in this figure. So I repeat this process for, uh, for my entire sample period. And thus I can get its time series. I, uh, I can get its time series. For comparison, I also plot factor model implied pricing kernels, uh, such as the CAPM and the Pharma French three factor model. Okay. In this figure, uh, panel A and panel B, panel A and panel B are the results from my unconditional and conditional pricing kernel estimates. They have a business cycle pattern and significantly react to financial market shocks, such as the 1998. Uh, LTCM crisis, 2008 financial crisis, and the COVID-19 crisis. And this pattern is consistent with Gauche, Juliet, and Taylor's uh, paper, who showed that, I mean, which showed that, which showed the similar pattern of the realized pricing kernel extracted from consumption data. However, this time variation is not observed in the CAPM or Pharma French three-factor implied pricing kernels, as you can see in panel C and panel D. For, for additional implication, I examine the conditional risk premium. As, uh, as, the, as, a result, as a result of the estimation, I obtained the pricing kernel estimates and the conditional risk neutral density. So by using, by using the relation among the pricing kernel, risk neutral density, and the physical density, I can find the conditional physical density through either the conditional, 
conditional pricing kernel estimate or the unconditional pricing kernel estimate. So then using the density after getting both densities, F star and F, or the risk neutral density and the physical density, it is straightforward to calculate the expectations of any moment of returns, which enables me to find the conditional risk premium. Through this analysis, I investigate different implications from my uh, conditional and unconditional estimates. So I calculate the equity, variance, skewness, and kurtosis risk premium inferred from the unconditional and the conditional empirical pricing kernels. And each result is summarized in panel A and panel B respectively. So for this, uh, I first calculate the conditional risk premium at each time t, and then, and then I report their time series statistics. While there is a little difference between uh, panel A and panel B for variance, skewness, and kurtosis risk premium, there's a huge difference, uh, huge difference for the equity premium. The average, the average equity premium in data is 0.7% per month, and this is well captured by the conditional pricing kernel estimate, but not by the unconditional, uh, unconditional pricing kernel estimate. Lastly, I'd like to talk about sources of the conditional equity premium. So uh, in other words, I study how much each future return state contributes to the, contributes to the total equity risk premium. And for this impl implementation, I follow Beeson and Schreindorfer to define the contribution of the return level R to the equity premium. It is formally defined as the following. The denominator here, the denominator is the total equity premium and the numerator is the partial integral up to the, up to the return level R. So using my, est using my pricing kernel estimates, the average contributions to the conditional equity premium are shown in this graph. Again, the blue line is based on the unconditional and the red line is based on the conditional pricing kernel estimate. And here the x-axis is the x-axis is the monthly return level from negative 100% to 30%. However, I'm more interested in uh, I'm more interested in studying the time varying contribution rather than its average. So in order to visualize the time variation, I find the return levels for the, for example, the 10% and 99% contributions at each time t. For example, suppose the contributions look like this at time t, then for the 10% contribution return levels, I take uh, the return levels corresponding to these red and blue dots. And for, for the 100% contribution return levels, I take the levels corresponding to these red and blue dots. So I repeat this for the entire sample period at each time t, and I get this time series. So this figure exhibits the time series contributions to the, the total equity premium for the 10% and 99% contribution. And the blue line, again, the blue line is based on the unconditional estimate and the red line is based on the conditional estimate. So in panel A, there is a little difference. I mean, there is a little difference uh, between the two time series of the return levels for the 10% contribution, except during the, during the crisis period. In contrast, we can see that the difference is very large for the 99% contribution in panel B. Uh, specifically, it becomes larger during economically bad times. And here, I, I believe that the dashed red line, uh, which corresponds to the conditioner, uh, I mean, which is inferred from the conditional pricing kernel estimate, it is more, uh, I believe that it, it looks more economically sensible because during bad times, investors are likely to require compensation for highly negative returns. The findings for the unconditional estimate contrast with this observation. Therefore, the
the conditional, uh, therefore the conditional pricing, conditional empirical pricing kernel makes more sense. Okay, uh, to conclude, uh, let me conclude uh, my paper, um, uh, my presentation. So in this paper, I propose a novel method to estimate the for looking conditional pricing kernel by incorporating condition uh, by incorporating conditioning variables. And then I find that the VIX term spread sentiment and market return are most informative about the pricing kernel. By looking at the, the pricing kernel estimates, the, uh, it shows that, I mean, it exhibits significant time variation and this time variation is economically sensible. Moreover, the conditional equity premium inferred from the conditional uh, empirical pricing kernel shows a more reasonable time series path compared to the unconditional pricing kernel estimate. In sum, I conclude that considering relevant uh, considering relevant conditional information is important in asset pricing. Uh, so this is all for my presentation. Uh, thank you so much. And please, uh, please yeah, uh, give me some feedback or ask any questions. All right, thanks, thanks very much. So now we have a few minutes for people to ask questions. Um, at this point, you should feel free to unmute yourself and ask your question using your microphone if you want. Um, while you're thinking about that, I'll read the one question from the chat, though it's not really a question. Um, so the one observation from the chat is that there's a 2013 JFE paper from Polkovnichenko and Zhao uh, that also estimate the conditional physical density. You don't have to remember that because Dimitri will send you the um, the chat log after oh. at sometime later this afternoon. But I have a question. Okay. Mm -hmm. So and and so you have these four conditioning variables, right? VIX, term spread, sentiment, and market return. Yes, correct. Right, so you have a pretty flexible specification of the conditional pricing kernel with lots of parameters to estimate. Yes. And am I correct that all of this empirical work and evaluation you show us is all in sample? Yes, it is all in sample. So are you planning on trying to do an evaluation out of sample? You probably know what I'm getting at, right? You have a very flexible pricing kernel yes. that you evaluate in samples. So maybe it's not surprising that it fits really well. Yes, 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 that's right. I mean, that is a really good question. And I, I have thought about that quite a lot. Uh, first of all, I'm thinking about, I'm thinking about doing out of sample analysis specifically using like a subsample analysis. So for example, uh, I can divide the sample into two periods uh, and then estimate for the first half, first period, and then test it for the second period. And that can be uh, one type of out of sample analysis. And the second one, second out of sample analysis might be using, uh, using other financial assets uh, to test if this pricing kernel makes sense but the problem here is that since what i'm looking at is the projected pricing kernel i'm actually you know uh i, I cannot consider the orthogonal component of the pricing kernel so orthogonal a pricing kernel component which is orthogonal to the market return that's why it is not easy to study out of sample analysis for different types of assets yeah uh so yeah so uh, to summarize, I, I'm, I'm actually planning to study the out of sample test in terms of like a time series subsample analysis. All right. Um, are there other questions? I don't want to keep him long, but Neil, can I have a question? Can I ask a question? No, feel free. Feel right, free. Right. We have, we still have, we have six minutes left. So. Oh, really? I thought, okay. I thought yeah. the second paper would start at one. That's why I was. No, no, okay. 110, ah. 110. So go, feel free to go ahead. Okay, now I have a bunch of questions, but 
I am sure some of my questions would be predicted. So let me ask a question that may not be predicted by Kim. Uh, instead of using the three factor from a French model, I would use actually uh, more uh, advanced or uh, more recent factor models. Since you have the sentiment, uh, mm -hmm. I would actually compare risk versus behavioral factor models. So, so I would, for example, use uh, DHS model by Kent Daniel and David Herschleifer because the post earnings announcement this could be a valuable uh, predicted here, I think, and in response to following up uh, Neil's question, I would actually replicate this out of sample firm valuation, and I would basically compare six factor from a French model with investment profitability and momentum, okay, mm -hmm. and the Q factor models, okay, okay. they have risk-based explanations, and then I would take as a horse race, Stambo and Yuan, mispricing factor mm -hmm. model, and DHS factor model. So these two behavioral and mispricing factor model that basically correspond to your in sentiment variable. And then you have the VIX or variance premia, or you could have used variance premia. So basically, I would like to see the perform out of sample performance of your conditional kernel, right? Uh, okay. Pricing kernel versus uh, risk factor models by Fama French and Lu Zhang, right? Uh, yes, uh -huh. the Q versus, factor model. Versus the mispricing and behavioral factor models, Stambo, Yuan, and DHS. Uh, then, okay. I see. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks a lot for the suggestion. Three factors from uh -huh. a French, factor from a French <clears throat> model is uh, is history now. I think uh, there is no need to use that, and its performance is really poor based on the picture I remember the graph. I That's see. All. Yeah. That's so uh, just to you know. So for this exercise, I just, I, I actually simply, for this exercise, I just simply wanted to say that my uh, realized pricing kernel estimates are more, you know, they fluctuate much more compared to the factor model implied pricing kernel. But so that was, you know, simply that was the, uh, that was the message that I, wanted, that I wanted to deliver here. But, but yes, uh, I, I totally agree with your, uh, your, uh, suggestion. That pricing, that pricing, uh, that pricing kernel is basically flat. From, from yeah, pricing. that's right. That's so right. I'm curious what investment and profitability or momentum factors will do. That's one. Okay. And okay. The other thing is post earnings announcement drift, PV mm -hmm. or some some powerful behavioral factors would do to the pricing kernel. I but see. this would be relevant for more firm value, out of sample firm valuation. Can I use this? This is more corporate finance question that you may not be able to predict. I have a bunch of other questions, but you would predict those. So. I see. Okay, thank you so much. Can I ask a question? Please, go ahead. Um, yes, so my first question is, um, in here you have, uh, you compare like the Pharma French result to other, like to your results. Um, um, did yes. you use, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, the first question, did you use the same like uh, loadings, like, you know, in the Pharma French compared to what you use VIX and other like conditioning variables? So do you use the same thing? Did you use the same thing when you use Pharma French? Because it need to be like an Apple and Apple comparison, right? Uh, I'm sorry, uh, I'm not. It's so when you use Pharma get, French, uh -huh. it should be Pharma French a uh, Pharma French uh, model that allows for like uh, loadings that are time varying, so yes. that you should be able to say the same. Did you did you do that? Oh, so so uh, let me. May, uh, okay, so are you asking? May uh, are you asking that if I use like a conditional factor model or the unconditional factor model? Yes, so that's the first thing because you have you need to compare Apple to Apple because you cannot use the Pharma mm -hmm. French, which is more like unconditional you know type. And then compare uh -huh. it to what you have. This is not is not really fair, right? Yes, so, uh, that is very yes. That is a very good question. Uh, but yes, uh, this figure is based actually based on the unconditional factor model and unconditional cap and unconditional form of French. But definitely, in order to compare, you know, apples to apple, I have to. I agree with you. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna implement this again using the conditional factor model to see how it looks like, how, yeah, how it looks like. So, and also mm -hmm. I have many other questions, but I will ask only a few. 
Okay. So the second question I have is that you have like like uh, you look at the sources of uh, you know you know time variation in the in the risk premium, right? Oh yes. Uh huh. Um. So how different is this from the exercise that I have in my paper with John? Oh yes. Uh. So it is. It is very. Uh, there is. There is a very, you know, I mean, uh, we share a quite common uh, with your paper. And I also looked at your paper and get some idea from your paper in terms of studying the conditional, you know, equity premium contributions. And the difference is that I want to compare, uh, I want to, I want to compare the estimation results or implications from the condition, from the, from the conditional estimate and the unconditional estimate of the pricing kernel. So that basically I, I wanna you know, use this as a tool to investigate the importance of considering conditional information in asset pricing. But technically, the, uh, you know, technically, technically studying the contributions to the equity premium itself has quite similar idea with your papers. So, um, so, okay, so uh, let me ask something else. Okay. So uh, the next question I have is, uh, you look at like, are you allow for time varying loadings? Okay. Yes. So um, it means that the risk aversion actually implicitly it's time varying. Okay. So yes. preference uh -huh. parameters could be time varying. Maybe could be time varying. Yes. So yes. what I don't see sometimes when you present the graphs here, you take the average, and then you, mm. you, you, you show the time series of the average, you know, the time series of the average over time. Okay. But I think what you should be really doing is to show us, show us a graph in a three dimension. So we need to see clearly what is going on with the SDF here. Like uh, in the dimension of the, like uh, you have time and also returns. So here, like I cannot really see what is going on, on here. You see what I'm saying? This is I interesting. See. But I want further, I want you to look, you know, further like into it and, you know, and also, you know, mm -hmm. say something about the preferences and, uh, you know, because you can recover the preferences as well. Too. So what but, do you but say? But in, in order to recover preferences, I have to assume a specific, specific like, a, you know, preferences or utility functions, right? Uh, not necessarily because you already did it anyway, because you actually... Uh, I think someone was saying that you should look at Valerie's paper, like uh, to estimate the physical one, right? Uh -huh. yes. So you uh -huh. use the gauge. So when you, you take a stand to estimate the physical probability. So as a result, I guess that implicitly, you know, it is already there. So I that, see. That's I, my... I'll take a look at it. Uh -huh. Yeah. So but we have, have more questions, but I will talk to you later on. Yeah. So, well, it's, thank you for saying great. Yeah. yeah. But we yeah. got it. We have to. We're we're stealing Heiner's time. Um, so, <laughs> so there are. There's a question and a comment in the chat. But uh, you know, Dimitri will send you the chat afterward. Okay. Anyway, Thank sorry, you so to, much. sorry to cut off the questions, but we have to move on to Heiner. Thank you so much.